you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 3 with me today. Revelation 3. We are going to look at the last of the seven churches. The last of the seven churches. And the title of the message is The Lukewarm Church. The Lukewarm Church. If you have a bulletin and you're following with us, the outline is this. Number one, they had lost their fire. They had lost their fire. Number two, they had lost their vision. They had lost their vision. Number three, they had lost their love. They had lost their love. You know, the city of Laodicea was a wealthy city, and it was inland about 40 miles from Ephesus. Steeped in Greek culture and learning, it was a thriving center of commerce and industry. Laodicea was also known for the manufacturing of a special eye salve, and a glossy black wool cloth. There were famous hot springs that were piped in from Hierapolis, and also there were cold springs from Colossae. One was six miles away, and the other was ten miles away. And the issue was that one was a filtering system, because it wasn't always clean water, and the second thing was it was piped so far, by the time it got to uh, Laodicea, the the hot water was not hot, and the cold water was not cold. And Jesus, three times, gives us examples of life examples of these three things about this last city. Uh, also, there were aqueducts. It was aqueducts that piped this water there. The problem was, in war times, people would uh, you know, mess with the aqueducts and cut, cut off their water supply, which made them very vulnerable. There was a huge banking center there and a school of medicine, which gave the city a wealthy, the city a reputation of a wealthy city. Financially, the church was well off, but there were spiritual problems that Jesus addresses in our text. Let's look at the last of the seven churches John writes about. Jesus says the church in Laodicea was the worst of the seven churches because of the apostasy that had come to the church. And remember, apostasy is a falling away from the faith. So, the lukewarm church, Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. They had lost their fire. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, these things say, amen, and faithful, and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And in these last two churches, you've noticed he went away from the uh, first chapter and 14, uh, first or fourteenth verse of descriptions. But these are also script, uh, uh, descriptions, excuse me, of Jesus, and it's talking about his divine, who he is, the divine Son of God. And Amen. When you hear somebody say Amen in a service. It literally means, so be it. But what you are also saying when you say amen, you are saying truth. The truth was just spoken. And we know Jesus is the way and the truth and the light. So he is the final authority. He is God in human flesh. He lived out his life. And the New Testament was all about him. So he is saying to this last last church, you are truth, and and, and amen, and you are faithful and true witness. Faithful speaks of being reliable. Folks, Jesus and God never changes. God's Word says they are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. They can be counted on. Their Word is truth. And then the third description is beginning of the creation. God and Jesus was not created. God didn't create Jesus. God and Jesus always was. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, he was in creation. Genesis 1 says he was in creation. The Trinity was in Genesis 1, and it's seen all through Scripture. So what John is pinning is the last message to these seven churches, and he's saying, I am speaking 
the truth from God. The truth. So let's look at this truth. Verse 15, I know your works. Folks, God knows everything about you. He knows what you say. He knows where you go. He knows what you do. And here's the scary part. He even knows what you're thinking. And I'm telling you lots of times, we will say the right thing, but in our minds we are thinking something else. And God knows everything we think. He knows the number of hairs on your head, says the Word of God. He knows the day and knew the day of your birth. He right now knows the day of your death. He is God. He is sovereign. So he is putting a microscope, okay, to this church, and he's saying, you're not fooling me. And we can fool some of the people some of the time, but we cannot fool God. And it says that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, folks, you talk about an indictment. And what he's saying is, basically, there's three types of people, individuals. And we said all along, he is talking about churches as a whole, but there's also uh, individuals. He's talking about us individually. And we, when he speaks of someone that is hot, okay, that means they're on fire for God. That means they are engaged in worship. That means they are men and women of prayer. That means there's not a day goes by that you don't pick up the Word of God and you feed from the Word of God. It's kind of like a new Christian. I love to be around new Christians. Why? Because the old Christians haven't corrupted them yet. Okay? What are you so excited about? Well, I just got saved. And, and I'm just telling you, folks, people that are on fire, a lot of people are intimidated by that. And some Christians will even make their statement, oh, they're just, they're just putting on. Nobody's that fired up about Jesus. I got news for you. There are people in the Word of God that were fired up about Jesus and fired up about God. Can I, can I remind you of a man named Job? Can I remind you of Job chapter 1? And what happened in Job chapter 1, none of us will go through. And I understand we all have broken hearts. We all are struggling. I mean, Job had bulls over him. And when I was even studying for this, I was thinking, you know what? I need to shut my mouth. I can breathe and I can still preach and I don't have bulls all over my body. I have not lost my house and my income and my family and all my children. But in Job... Chapter 1, look at it with me. Job 1, you talk about somebody on fire for God. Look at verse 20. And Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, which was a sign of mourning, but it was basically saying, yes, I've lost all this. Because people knew, even in those days, they found out what Job was going through. And it says, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. I'm wondering how many of us would do that if we lost everything. Everything we lost. You know what our wife's, his wife's advice was? Curse God and die. Well, <laughs> that's not good advice, ladies. All right? He worshiped God. And look what he said. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He praised God in the storms of life. It didn't take away his enthusiasm for his God and his Savior. And folks, you got to have a test to have a testimony. And people are watching everything we do and how you address adversity and what you say and your actions is a witness to people around you. And I'm telling you, Job was on fire for God. And he didn't waver at all. And then verse 22, In all this Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. No, he wasn't perfect. 
He was upright, the Bible says, in that chapter. He was a man that sought, sought God with all his heart. He loved God with all his heart and with all his strength and served God. But he went through a devastating time in his life, and he said, hey, whether I live or die, I am going to serve my Savior. So we see somebody that is hot. Then we talk about somebody that is cold. And folks, you witness to folks. I have witnessed to folks and shared the gospel with them. And they've made all kinds of statements with them. One man told me, why would I need God? I've got everything I, I need. I've got a house. I've got a good job. I've got money. I've got this. Why would I serve this God you're talking about? And people that are cold don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. They live their whole life without Christ. And a lot of them do not come under conviction. And folks, I am telling you, these people, I'm telling you, they, they are living their life just not con ever connecting, not seeing Bible reading is a priority, not going to church on Sunday. You know, they don't seek God. They just live life and live for themselves mainly. They are self people. They, everything is about them and what they have done in life. And then the third is the lukewarm. And folks, the lukewarm Christians are those who used to be on fire, but they are just going through the motions. Things that they used to do for God, they don't do anymore. Doesn't mean they walked away from God. It simply means they are not on fire. And here's the deal, folks. The people that are lukewarm and the people that are cold, uh, and, 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 and those are hot, when you think of those, the people that are lukewarm, they are not a good example of either one on each side. Because the lost people say, and I've heard somebody say this to a, a, to a cold person, say this to a lukewarm Christian, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you went to church. Why is that coming out of your mouth? Why are you doing this? So they can be a stumbling block to the lost. And they can be a stumbling block also to the saved. Because the saved don't understand why. And folks, I'm not saying we're judging one another. Here, Jesus is taking our spiritual temperature. It's not talking about water, even though water was the issue at Laodicea. That was the example he was using. But he's talking about our spiritual life. Folks, I'm telling you, if you are the same spiritually as you were a year ago, I'm telling you, you are a lukewarm Christian according to the Word of God. And notice how extreme this is. This is why I'm telling you the truth. Folks, this is Jesus' words. I'm just the messenger. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. I will vomit you out of my mouth. And in a way, he's saying, when do we vomit? When we are sick. And Jesus is saying, your lifestyle, your words, your actions make me sick. And folks, that's an atrocity to a Christian. I'm telling you, we should be well spiritually. We should have fire in our bosoms and in our souls. And yet he says, this church makes me sick. Look at verse 17, because you say, remember what he's saying, he's telling them the truth, I am rich and have become wealthy. And folks, People that are rich are depending on themselves. Hey, they'll take stock in the stock markets, but when those stock markets crash, what do they have now? I have need of nothing, and, and, and do not know that you are wretched. That means wretched is, is without. You, you, you just, you're not happy, okay? You pretend to be happy, but you are not happy. You are miserable. We know what misery is. Misery is you don't want to get up every day. You don't want to go to church on Sundays. You don't want to read your Bible. You don't. Why? Because it convicts you. 
It convicts you. You are poor. Again, he's talking about spiritually poor. You are blind. You can't see. You can't see as God sees. And you are naked. And again, he's not saying running around naked. He says you are not clothed in the righteousness of God. Folks, it's white robes. And again, that doesn't mean we are pure and we are always do the right thing. It's saying we are saved. We know we're saved. We know that we are going to heaven. And here, he just simply says, folks, we should not be that way as Christians. We should not be lukewarm. And the second thing that you can see, not only they had lost their fire, they had lost their vision. He says, I counsel you. And by the way, there was no you know, compliment for this church. Mo you know, five of the seven churches were complimented, but not this church. Jesus had nothing good to say about this church. And I thank God it, you know, it's not speaking to us. It is speaking to individuals. But to us, it is not speaking to us as a church, and I give God the glory for that. And I counsel you to buy from me gold refi refined in the fire. When we think of gold, we think of the material part of gold. But how is it refined? Through fire. When you light all, I mean, when you, you put a heat on those, it melts, and the impurities fall off of that again he's not talking about literal gold but gold is expensive anybody that's bought something uh, gold it's expensive but he's not talking about the rings on our fingers or the necklaces that we wear he's talking about spiritual spiritually what is he saying he's saying if you know jesus christ as your personal savior you are rich you're rich your god is your heavenly father Jesus is your Savior. The Holy Spirit is your guide. And when you die, you are going to heaven. And folks, to get saved, you have to realize that you're lost. There are people that don't understand that they're lost because somebody told them it is okay. When I was in youth ministry, this would happen. Somebody would get saved. A youth would get saved at a revival. And, and they had not been living for Christ. And I had a man tell me one time, the father, he said, this young man is saved. I led him to Christ myself. Well, he don't think he's saved. What do you do? Bank all of eternity on my father said I was saved? Folks, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit was telling him he was lost. And we need to respond to the Holy Spirit, not to someone's opinion. So we need to be rich spiritually, which is saved. We need white garments, white garments, that you may be clothed, that's righteousness of God, that the shame of your neckness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eyesight that you may see. Oh, folks, what Jesus is saying is, in talking about the eye and the sight, we have lost our vision. We have lost our vision. Folks, there's a lost world out there. They are dying and they're going to hell and we have the cure for sin. We have the cure for lostness. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're just punching the clock is what he's saying. You're going to church, but nothing ever changes. People are not changing. People are not getting saved. The baptismal waters are not moving. You think you're okay, but you cannot see that you are coasting. You're just coasting through life. And that's what he's talking about, the eye salve. Matter of fact, having a vision is so important for church growth, for church growth. Matter of fact, uh, Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs 29, 18. It says, where there is no revelation... The people cast off restraint. I like the King James Version better. Where there is no vision, the people will perish. Oh, folks, we have to have an, a vision for God. 
We have to have a vision for Jesus Christ. We have to have the Holy Spirit in our life. We don't need to go through the motions of things. And Jesus is saying, you as a church, you have lost your vision. What you used to do, you're not doing anymore. The most important thing in any church, any church is winning souls to Christ. Yes, we need to worship. Yes, we need discipleship. Yes, we need fellowship. We are Baptists. We got an A-plus in fellowship. I love to fellowship. I love to eat your food and eat your desserts. And the only thing it changes is my belt line. <laughs> Folks, Jesus wants us to be actively pursuing the lost. Inviting them to come in. Inviting them to our church. Realizing that hell is real and lostness, that's exactly where they will go. And he says, they cannot see it they cannot see it second kings chapter six i love this old testament example the king of syria uh, was making war second Kings six against israel and they were making plans but the man of god who was elisha elisha god was giving him the notes to where the war was going on he was telling uh, the children of israel where they were going to be it was as if, even though he wasn't, I mean, the king even thought, all right, who's selling us out? Who is the traitor here? Who's giving them the plans? How do they know every time we make a move, they are there and they are waiting for us and they annihilate us? Why? Because God's prophet was on their side. And you think of Israel. Folks, Israel, you talk about up and down. I'm pretty sure Baptists have that Israel roots in them. I love God, I love God, I love God. Oop, I don't have time for God. Oh, no, I can't do this. Look all through the Old Testament. Serving God. He gets them out of all these things. He parts Red Seas. He, he, he leads them out of bondage. And he looks, they look at Moses and say, hey, you got us out here to die. We got nothing to eat. That's why I know they're Baptists. They didn't have bread to eat and they didn't have quail to eat. And what, who provided that for them? It was God, folks. So you can see in the history of the children of Israel just up and down and up and down and up and down. And at this point, Elijah knew what was going on and God was connecting with him and God was telling them everything the Syrians were going to do. Now look in verse 14. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. They came by night. There were thousands surrounding that city. And his servant said to him, Alas, master, what shall we do? It's kind of like, you know, the long ranger and Tano, they are out there, and the Indians were surrounding him. And he asked, the Lone Ranger asked Tunnel, what should we do? I don't know about you, Kimasabi, but I am a Native American. <laughs> <laughs> and this servant, young, not knowing, really probably ignorant of what God had planned to do, says, man, we're doomed. We are going to die here. Verse 6, so he answered, do not fear. Oh, folks, I wish, I wish we could just learn this. Our response to many things is fear. Our first response to many things is fear. And over 365 times in the Word of God, Old Testament and New Testament tells us not to fear. Then why are we fearing? Why are we fearing? Do not fear. Those who are with us are more than those who are them. That servant's looking around and saying, oh my goodness, one, two. Elijah, I don't know about your math, okay? I'm not getting this. Why? He could not see what Elijah was seeing. And look at this, and Elijah prayed. Oh, folks, we need to spend more time praying 
than bargaining with God. See, we pray our will for our lives. We pray when we're desperate. We almost use prayer as a last resort. Elijah prayed, and the Lord said, and Elijah said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and when he saw, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire all around Elijah. Oh, folks, God knows your situation in life. God knows how desperate you can be. But God's got a plan. God's got a plan. There's nothing greater than Almighty God. There were angels fighting the battles for them. So when the Syrians came down to them, Elijah prayed to the Lord and said, Strike these people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to Elijah. Now, folks, it's never over till God says it's over. It's never a lost cause. No one is ever so far from God that they can't come back. You have to do it God's way. We have to do it God's way. We need to keep our vision. You need to see what Jesus sees and see what God sees and have the heart of God and have the heart of Jesus. And I'm telling you, it is salvation first. It is discipleship, and it is ministry, and then it is fellowship. See what he sees, lost and dying people. When I see these Jew cities of New York and L.A. and people crowded in there, my first thought is, I wonder how many lost people are in that city. Thousands. Thousands. Lost people in our world. Millions. But yet, folks, we don't see we don't have the vision that God wants us to have. So this church had lost their vision. And then the last thing, they lost their fire. They lost their fire. Look at verse 19. Not their fire, excuse me. They lost their fire, they lost their vision, and they lost their love. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. How do you lose your love? Folks, again, it just turns into going through the motion. It just turns into attending church. It just, you know, it just turns into to not being on fire for God and, and just you know, trying to, uh, you know, people, <laughs> I hear this phrase, even from Christians, well, I'm just treading water. <laughs> well, folks, God says in John 10, 10, He has come that He may give us life and give us life abundantly. I don't want to just be surviving as a man of God and as a Christian. I want to be thriving. Man, I want His blood to run through my veins. His thought to run through my head. His ways to, to influence me in a, in, a, in a positive way. But as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And folks, we all know how children are and when you're a kid I'm, I'm just telling you when i turn i would say somewhere around 13 years old and i think this is true with a lot of youth my brain just checked out for a while <laughs> and my favorite saying my dad said i'd get in trouble and i'd do something stupid and he would just say what were you thinking and i just got to saying i guess i wasn't thinking man i wish you'd think <laughs> I wish you would think. And I frustrated my dad so much. Looking back, I frustrated him so much. But I remember one time I did something that was just totally unacceptable. When I was 14 years old, I got arrested for shoplifting. And here's what I told the cop that put me in the car. I said, I'm going to take off running, and if you'll just shoot me, I'm telling you the truth. I won't have to face my dad. When they dropped me off at the house, mom was there, and thank God dad wasn't there. And mom just says, you ain't getting out of this one, son. You, you're in big trouble. Go to your room. And I'll never forget it. Three and a half hours later, he comes in. 
he looks at me. It still breaks my heart. Usually he'd take the belt off and start whooping me, even at 13. But he said, I'm ashamed of you. You shamed our family too. Mike, you need to change. And turned around and walked out. That was the most effective chastening I ever had. Because I told God that day, I will never do this again. Ever. And it literally changed my life. So it says, why do we, why do we spank or chastise? Why do we put kids on restrictions? Folks, I'm just telling you, this timeout thing ain't working. Okay? I, it's not. It's not working. We, tie, we time at them and we negotiate with them. It's, the, like, it's like detention at school. All right? I, I was there, you know, sometimes. And what they do, they put you in a room with all the other bad kids. And I'm thinking, hey, this, this ain't so bad. We've got to understand the reason we discipline our children. And again, let me say this. You should never discipline in anger. Never. Never. If you are angry, you go to the room, you talk to God, and then you go back in and you discipline them. All right? There's a difference between hitting them on their bottom. Why do you think our bottoms are so big? <laughs> you can't miss, folks. And that's where it should happen. You should never strike a kid in the face. I'm telling you, when I see that, it takes every bit of my being not to walk over and slap the parent and tell them, I don't think you understand what you are doing to that kid. God disciplines us because he loves us. I cannot tell you how much God loves you. I cannot express how much God loves you. And in spite of all my stupidity, as a young child, God called me to the ministry. And if you want to think that I think I deserve to be in this place, you are seriously wrong. I should still be in adult detention. But God loved me in his grace. He poured his love out on me and he showed me there is a better way. And that better way is knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. See, it wasn't until I was 22 years old that I truly found Christ. I made a decision when I was five. I made another decision when I was uh, 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 14. But I didn't find Christ. My eyes did not open up till I got saved and I was 22 years old. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and I will dine with him, and him with me. I've heard different preachers preach this two different ways. I've heard him preach saying, he's talking about a lost person. Jesus is outside the door, and that I believe is true. But I also believe he is speaking to the Christian today. He used to be in the center of your home. He used to be Jesus in the center of your life. And now what you've done, you've just slowly pushed him out the door. Slowly. And folks, we need to open the door. Jesus in the book of John said, I am the door. The only way you're going to be saved is through Jesus Christ. The only way you're going to rededicate your life and truly rededicate is repent of your sins. You know when you sin. You know when it's wrong. You know God is not happy with this. And the only one that can change you is you. We make excuses about it. And we say, look at others. I'm not as bad as that guy. Hey, God doesn't care about that. 
He cares about you. He's talking about this church. He's talking about us as individuals. In verse 21, And to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Oh, folks, you have to understand that we have to do it God's way. And the end is the best. The best is yet to come. We will be in heaven because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and He has chosen us. We will have thrones. We will rule with Him because of His mercy and because of His grace. 1 John 2. 1 John 2. Verse 15. No, excuse me. Verse 18. 1 John 2, 18. Little children, it is the last hour. Folks, we're living in the last days. I hope you can figure that out. I mean, we're studying the book of Revelation. The very introduction of the book of Revelation should have showed that to you. Jesus could come any day. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Anti means against Christ. The world is telling us how to do and how to be and what to say. They're shoving sin down our throats. We can't turn on the TV without seeing sin and sin and more sin. And it becomes, and we are, we are normalizing sin. Abominations to God in the, in, in the Old Testament are seen playing out on our TVs and our smartphones. And why? Yeah, go ahead. Why do we call something a smartphone that makes us dumb? I don't get that. Okay? We make dumb decisions with smartphones. They went out from among us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. And you know what? The person that I just, just when I witness to this person, they say this in jet, you know, in, in, you know, the summation of what they're saying is, I was saved when I was seven, eight, nine years old, and I know kids can be saved. But they had been out of church for 20, 30, 40 years, and now they're just coming back. They were among us, but they were not of us. Folks, we are kidding ourselves if we think everyone in this sanctuary is saved. I'm not criticizing. I am telling you the truth. And we are truly kidding ourselves if we think everyone in this sanctuary is right with God. Jesus said, folks, it's Jesus. It's revelation. It's the last church. It's the last thing he says to the church on earth. You're faking it. You're trying to convince people that you're saved and you're spiritual and you're not. You need to do something about it. Repent and change. Repent and change. But they went out that they, uh, they would have continued with, but they went out that they may be made manifest that none of them was of us. Oh, folks, I know there's Christians in this building. I'm not to, trying to imply that at all. I'm simply saying there are lost folks here today. God is trying to get your attention. God has spoke to you before the Holy Spirit has spoke to you before and you just keep telling yourself, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Folks, is that how God sees it? And then there are many, many Christians here that you are not on fire for Christ. You used to be. Man, you took off running. <laughs> you were a star athlete for God. But now, you're just, you know, kind of strolling. You're just moseying through life. I don't want to make waves. I don't want to make anybody mad. Well, folks, I'm telling you, God is saying it's an individual decision. Whatever God tells you to do today, would you do it? Would you get saved if you're lost? If you don't know for sure that if you were to die today, would you just come down and tell us, Brother Mike, I'm not sure. I want to make sure today. If you're a Christian, 
you can do one of two things. You can come to this altar. And to be honest with you, if everyone here did what they were supposed to, this altar would be full today. Full. Or you can come to one of us and say, would you pray with me? I need to publicly rededicate my life. If you need to come for baptism or church membership, God is speaking to the church. I pray that you would hear and that you would obey. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for this last church. Man, I know it's a hard sermon. But God, it is truth. And God, I pray right now your Holy Spirit is telling us what to do. God, I pray that we would obey. I pray we wouldn't think about our spouse, our girlfriend, our boyfriend, our brothers or sisters or acquaintances. God, I pray that we'd circle our own life God sees things different than we see it. And God, I pray that you would open our spiritual eyes to obey you and to trust you and to not be ashamed. There's nothing wrong with walking down an aisle. There's nothing wrong with getting right with you. And God, I pray that your will be done this day. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises of your word. And God, I pray that you would open our spiritual eyes, and open our spiritual ears that we can hear clearly what you want us to do this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?